Welcome to the Wide World of Punting, episode three of our second season where we go even more in depth in our punting conversations. I'm Jacob Wynn from The Tripod, and in a moment we're jumping straight back into part two, my chat with Mark Porter. It's great to hear from you guys that a lot of people enjoyed part one. If you didn't catch that, you can definitely jump straight out of here and uh, check it out on YouTube, Facebook, or any pod players, or just hang around, listen to part two. If you find that interesting, you can always go back. Tonight, we've also got Tristan back on the show. We're going to talk to him about some similar topics that we covered with Mark, like how the industry's changed, to ask Tristan to reflect on the biggest changes from his perspective in the last 10 years. We've got the Wide World Better the Week, which is going to be linked to the big bash that fires up this weekend. If that's the only part of the pod that's tied to any current event and uh, that's always going to be at the very end of the episode if you're interested. So back to Mark Porter in uh, part one of our conversation last week's episode we talked about his really interesting journey that he's had through working for a professional betting syndicate, a bookie, his own business, how he started Punt Hub, um, lots to do with like what it's like to run a big group from both of us, ideas he has of how he wants to make the group even better in the future and some very honest and hopefully good advice about responsible gambling. Part two covers more about day-to-day challenges involved in running a big group, the people involved, stress, the costs involved, and the abuse that you do cop uh, regardless of of all the efforts. Uh, We talk about creating more original content, such as the show No Morals that we had this year. And then we talk about the big topic of group monetization, the affiliate links that you see running through groups like mine or Punt Hub, um, what the revenue models are with that, other ways groups can make money, working for the bookies, which I say in air quotes. But anyway, we kind of explain how that all actually works. But our chat begins jumping into ways that Punt Hub has actually grown. As I mentioned last week, it's up to nearly 100,000 members now. So Mark talks about how that has happened. One thing I will say, actually, and I didn't touch on this earlier, is that people say, oh, yeah, there's a lot of um, luck involved in how we got sort of big as well. Like, it's not just that we've, you know, we're not, we haven't, undis- like, discussed, sorry, we haven't discussed, discovered some crazy secret. And we were, it was very much in the right place at the right time for us. Like, us, yourself, there's a couple of other groups out there and stuff like that, you know, other people that it's kind of we were in the right place at the right time and survived sort of some shaky times and stuff so it's not that i mean to start a group now and to try to build it to something like that to nearly 100 like it would be so hard because there's so yeah. many out there there's one so thing many. i reckon is we were both probably early onto the whole notion of a facebook group like the first group i was ever in on facebook was a tripod group you know or one yeah. of the very first like we had this idea that I, I think I read on like um like just some article through Google or whatever that like groups can be get more engagement than pages. And I, yeah. and I remember just talking to Alex about it, like, let's just try. And what I realized pretty quickly is you do get way more engagement. You get people commenting and saying, oh, yeah, I'm on this with you or I disagree because they don't feel like their partner or their parents or their, their work colleagues can read that, whereas they might if they're commenting on a public page. So there's yeah, that feeling really that they're within a community. So then yeah. actually the group like really did grow. But, you know, yeah, that was like, that was back when people weren't in many groups. Like that probably would have been no, one that's... of the only groups. But nowadays there's so many groups that like you can be in a bunch and you wouldn't even see half the posts that are in those groups. 100%. That would be a much bigger challenge is um, how are you going to grow if you don't have kind of engagement within your group? Yeah, 100%. 100%. So we did do the we did the engagement pretty well, and we try to do the daily tipping threads and stuff. But they've kind of like fizzled at the moment. Like we we it's really funny. Like anything, like it's sort of like cyclical and like seasonal. We've gone through some really great times um, in like in the group where we've had some funny pricks posting, and there's like and there's some really good tipsters posting. You know, like some of our tips have been going well. Some of the admin tips have been going well, and it just hums along and like. It's felt like those days you sort of like, fuck, this is great. I actually feel like it is a community. Like I feel like there'd be a bunch of us. If we all went to the races one day, everyone, like it feels like harmonious, you know, this great idea. There's also, and we're in a bit of a lull at the moment where our our tips from Pan Hub that I do with sort of like a business partner and another guy, horrible. They're going, you know, we're going legless at the moment. The, the 
daily tips, the tipping threads aren't really getting attention. People are just trying to post their own tips, which is kind of fine. Because, like, it's so easy for me to sit there because I'm involved in the group and all day, every day, I know what the rules are. But, like, put yourself in the shoes of, like, someone else. Like, someone else might get a 20-minute break at work and they just go, all right, and they open Facebook and they'll just see a post that the algorithm has put on their screen. And they'll go, oh, this guy's having a bet. Yeah, when's that? Hawkesbury. Okay, shit, that's in half an hour. Yeah, I'll have a bet on that. They're not going to sit there and spend hours and scroll through the group to see, you know what I mean? So so it's 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 a bit righteous of us to think like, you know, follow the rules, guys, like pony post in the daily threads. And some people are like, fuck, man, fuck your daily threads. I don't, I'm not worried about that. If you, here's my tip, I'll just post it in the group. If you guys don't allow it, well, that's your loss. Yeah, you know, yeah, so. like you've got all these rules, but not necessarily everyone's read them. Or there was a major issue in the groups. So you're like, I need to address this. So you're going to like put a big post up and address it, like whatever. Yeah. But the yeah. truth is, while a lot of people might read that post, three yeah, weeks later, don't. there's new people. Yeah, and they haven't read it and stuff. Yeah. But then they're repeating, you know, a behavior or, or an issue that you thought you'd already kind of handled. But you're right. Like every, so many people are just dipping in for, you know, one minute or whatever. So it's, so it's very exactly. hard. Yeah. It's hard to keep them all, like, it's hard to, it'd be hard to keep, keep a group with, you know, 400 people, like, to, to all on this, to follow the same style of posting and rules and stuff. And then you get, like, obviously people don't want to, and there are people in there with that are trying to, like, they've got their own little sort of, like, tipping service, so they don't want to post in the thread because it doesn't get, they think it doesn't get seen by as many people and all that stuff. So, I mean, how do you combat that? I don't know. Is the answer like we were thinking of you know, of trying to say to everyone um, turn off posts so only the admins can post and put a daily thread until the more if people like that thread they'll get a notification when someone comments so then that's something that we're, we're sort of tossing up trying but then that could also kill the engagement because you've got to remember there's also people out there that just want to post something either nonsensical that might be funny or post something like they're like there was one guy I think that had a seventeen thousand dollar multi that lost by half a point or something. Um and he's like, you know, fuck, look at this. It was an NBA player prop or something. I don't know. Um so there's those things that you'd lose and and that's part of the group, right? Some people there are people out there like like tips, not slips, which I get. I you know if I get to some it to most the most of the extent I get that. I don't want to see someone post a ten dollar bet where they won seventy five bucks on something, like to me that's just I'm just like oh, but that guy's like that might be his biggest thing ever. So he's like yeah, look at me, right? Like so, it's kind of hard to to find that middle ground where you where you you want to encourage people to engage, but you don't want them to get laughed off or or just be like you know have people roll their eyes and think fuck this dribbler's doing this. Um, yeah, ultimately, so, yeah. it's like trying to keep the standard or the quality of the posts within your group high because if a bunch of, like, garbage posts get approved and are in there, people will kind of tune out. If every, yeah. you know, if they're scrolling through Punt Hub and, like, every second post is just, like, Ballarat Race 3-1, get on, and then every other yeah. post is, like, boom, and that someone just hit a $4 winner or whatever, but it's meaningful to them. And the next post is, should I cash out? And, you know, oh, they're just, like, so yeah. not, not, not interested. So it comes back to, like, what's interesting? What would be things that I'd want to send to people in the group chat? And like, if somebody's got the last leg of their multis on today and they stand to win 50K, like, yeah, I, I don't mind, like, allowing that That's post cool. in because it's, yeah. like, yes, yeah, so group interest. Or if someone's had the worst beat of all time, it's, like, yeah. oh, my God, like, you kind of – you are interested. So that's where we, we have to use like exercise some judgment or, you know, admins that in the group of what you allow in. But yeah, how many do you see of like, boy, should I cash out? And people probably don't understand. It's like how many posts are coming through each day. And that like you referred to like working at a pub over the years, but you can let people know, but like, you still work full time at a pub, yeah. um, which ties yeah. into, I think into the affiliate conversation that, and what you said before about yeah. investing in the website is people think that, you you run Pun Hub with ninety three thousand members, so you must be a millionaire. Like people think you must be raking in the cash. It's really yeah. not not the reality. Um, no. But but also I, I was just getting back to that point. I think of time consuming. It's like so many people are putting their posts through, and then we've got to constantly be monitoring that, deciding what gets approved, what doesn't, and then it's all like, oh, this got approved too late. I posted a tip and it won. 
an hour ago, but you didn't approve it. Like people expect that it sh- there should be um someone monitoring twenty four seven because I think yeah, I presume Pun Hub you're no. currently going on on admin approval because you can't really yeah, just yeah. not do that or otherwise the group would have hundreds of posts per day. And it just goes to shit. It just goes to absolute shit. Oh, we've done that. We used to do it every every couple of Sundays, which I just go right free <laughs> for all. You guys, approvals off, go nuts. And it was kind of easy now because I don't know if you know, I don't know if you guys have set this up, but there's Admin Assist, which is a Facebook. For the audience out there, Facebook has a thing now called Admin Assist where, like, it's using their AI. You can you can just um, – Like filter. Not, well, you can just not allow posts with, like, a link to a certain site. So say I don't want – so we've put Telegram, like, I think it's w, yeah. www.t.me slash. So any Telegram link that that – that shouldn't that shouldn't just be able to be um, posted or commented. You can do the same with comments. We've turned off anyone posting without a profile picture because um, we were getting heaps of like scammy sort of like non-profile picture um, people. Um, they can't make a post or comment if they've had a Facebook account for less than six months. And we often don't even let them in the group now if they've had a Facebook account for less than six months. Um, uh, and there's a lot of them. Uh, and people so, probably wouldn't realise, like, I actually get people messaging me, oh, like, I'm so frustrated. Someone commented on my post, you know, and it was a spam Telegram link. And, like, why yeah. are you letting these people in? And people don't probably realise that it's actually like a um, an infestation of these bots that are Please. just constantly – and. They get in and whether they got in months ago and then they add their friends in or whether they're – but they're also add, jumping in daily. And, like, you are doing this similar to us. Like, we, um, we've we got, like, certain filters that automatically won't accept, you know, people yep. who've made an account in the last year or whatever. And then we manually, like, comb through them because there might be yeah, people same. who paid you to try and let them in or whatever. But for every, like, one or two that gets in and then instantly spams seven posts in the thread – with like a, you know, whatever, fixed matches, Telegram link here, whatever, or guaranteed wins, Telegram. Yeah. There's probably a few hundred that we've rejected as well. So people like oh. actually will, will take it out on, on me or you or other admins, or oh, you're doing a crap job, when actually I might have spent, you know, I might have spent 15 minutes on my phone, like, you know, on a yeah. Sunday morning, like filtering through, trying to like weed out as many as we can. Like it's actually a current epidemic um, on Facebook Massive. of these and it's all, I think, like, Facebook needs to do a better job of, um, but I don't know, obviously it wouldn't be easy, but, like, maybe maybe goes back to, like, verifying people's identity because the amount of fake accounts that are on Facebook is just insane. Yeah. But then I guess the argument is, like, do people have a right to be anonymous on Facebook? If you're a school teacher, if and, you're a police officer, also, you don't want to have your real name on there. I actually respect all that as well, yeah. that people might be want to be on Facebook, not on their real name, but then... Yeah, all these fake accounts is actually like a real time-consuming issue for, for group admins. The, the thing with the, the Telegram, I know this is conspiracy. This is silver tinfoil hat type of stuff. But, <laughs> but someone, a guy that I'm, I, you know, pretty techie sort of guy, he reckons it's in their interest because they're, they, they're all part of the metrics. So if you're paying advertise, if you're paying Facebook, 600 bucks a day to reach Australian men ages 18 to 64 if if I don't know 3,000 of those accounts are just fakes like it makes their spend look better does that make sense yeah yeah that does I hadn't thought of that but I actually see so, what you mean like it so, makes the so, traffic and the engagement look yeah, bigger like, which actually benefits Facebook right. yeah and they're like okay so you know but then the, I said, but but if I'm if I'm if I'm spending that money, like let's say I'm selling clothes and I'm yeah. spending that money and I'm getting X amount of impressions, um, an impression I think is when it's like a set of eyeballs see it. But if it's a bot, obviously they'll it'll come up on the bot's page, but then there's no one watching that. Yeah. Um. Then my actual conversion is in people that are buying clothes will be tiny, right? Yeah. And then after after a while, you'd think well. That's like I'm not going to spend money on this form of marketing anymore. But like my mate said, but it's kind of it ta- it, they've made enough money out of that amount of time that it takes the that business to find out that the conversions never yeah. get better. That's what you got then, me thinking. It's like a short term, 
a business thinks if we can reach 10,000 people, that's worth X dollars to us. And yep. then it's in Facebook's interest for those numbers to be inflated. But yeah. sustainability wise, what you said, like if you're reaching non-genuine customers, you're not going to actually get that return on investment um, yeah. from your marketing but, spend in the long run. But it might take you quite a while to figure that out. It'll take and, um, a year or something. Yeah, it'll take exactly. You 12 months of, and they'll try all these different marketing terms. I don't really, I'm not a marketing sort of student, but, you know, A, B testing. They'll be trying all these different things. Why aren't people buying this, these clothes? Or, or they will, they'll, they'll hit a few and they might just think, well, that's, 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 the, that's the conversion rate. rate. Yeah, that's yeah. the conversion rate. You know, it's uh, on, Instagram, it's better, but apparently Instagram, there's heaps of bots too. There's like in comments and stuff, there's heaps of bots, but I mean, I don't know about that. But um, but ultimately, if it takes away from the user experience, and as you say, like long-term advertisers are going to get frustrated about it, but that actually is really interesting that like um, there's only so much Facebook can do and it, not, it isn't necessarily um, to their detriment if um, yeah. if a lot of numbers are, are inflated. Um, yeah. But that's, that's some of the challenges. But I thought I also wanted to ask like any other positive highlights or memorable moments that come up. So oh, now you've been... run the group for three or four years. Um, there's lots of like funny moments. Like you mentioned when when somebody shares a great tip and it really makes a lot of sense and a lot of people jump on and then we you know you cause a bit of a plunge and then it wins. Like that's an awesome feeling, like a community feeling that we're all in yeah. it together and we've all, you know, won on, on a long odd multi or, or, or a long shot. Does anything kind yeah. of spring to mind for you? Uh, well, like we said, we, you and I have talked about like, so I, so in terms of a bet, I mean, there's been the runs like Jay, Jason Campbell, JC started, um, in pun hub and went on like five in a row and, and that was pretty cool. And, and it's funny, I don't know if this is true or not, but, um, like I reckon he almost started the long form tip as in maybe other people had been doing other groups. I don't know. But for my in my memory, whether it's biased or not, it was Jason that started. He was like Hawkesbury, race four, number six, da da, da. and he would write a, like a long form tip. So he'd say, you know, this four year old gilding out of whatever breeding it was, you know, trained at this camp, has trialed blah blah blah, and he would go in into like significant depth about why he was putting that tip forward. Um, and he went on five in a row, right? And it was that was crazy those times. Um, and and then Benny Scarf eclipsed that this yeah, year with six or seven yeah, in a row. Eight, I think didn't he? I think oh, geez, eight, yeah. I don't want to sell him straight. short. Sorry, Benny. Yeah. Shout out so, Scarfy because obviously yeah. we collaborated to actually bring those two blokes together um, over yeah. spring, and that ties into like what you know one of the goals that you had spoken about before of like making it a community that and and creating content that would be meaningful and informative and entertaining for the people that are in the community. So that was a bit of yeah. a trial run, what we've been through over the last, what that eight weeks of spring block there, yeah, was, getting these boys sick. together. I, yeah. I mean, I enjoyed it. I think a lot of people enjoyed it, you know, and like, it's funny, I spoke to, well, for the audience, so it was your idea. So shout out to Jacob here. So for the audience, Jacob spoke to me and said, Mark, I've got this idea. What do you reckon about, why don't we get because ben, Benny Scarf was on, he was either towards the end of his like when he was tipping all these winners in a row, right? And it was, it was piss funny. His videos were obviously very funny. He's like, he's got a good sense of humor, Scarf. And he's like, why don't we bring together the two like young guys, the two younger that, that have the biggest sort of following and just bring them together? And it's kind of cool because they're, they're, they're sort of different personalities, right? They're not two cheeky blokes that are just trying to take the piss out of each other. They're also not two analytical guys that are just trying to sort of like out, out data each other, out stat perform each other. They're sort of one and one of each, and they're both they're both good at what they do. Um, and there's there's more that goes on behind the scenes that people sort of I had to defend Benny and said, oh, he's just saying he's just picking a number and just says back Benny win playing. I said, look, I know Ben. There's a bit more of behind the scenes. He's not just throwing darts. Um, so, and I think the fact that he tipped all those winners in a row, and like he went on a shit run before that, and he'll admit to that too. So, I mean, he's. I'm on a similar run now where it's just we've had, I think, a oh, horrible run in the last sort of two and three weeks. So it happens. But, you know, I was hoping that the audience would trust that given that he's done some, you know, had some of these runs, it's obviously 
you can't throw that many darts and, and keep hitting bullseye. Um, so anyway, that was Jacob's idea. And he said, why don't we bring them together and see how we go? And we were like, and we got them on, on a chat group on Facebook. And we're like, all right, um, we need some names. And I think you, you came up with no morals too. You were like, some young boys with boys ripping and tearing, you know, when you have it, no morals. And I was like, perfect, that's it. Um, and I was like pretty happy with that. I've never done video. I mean, even this is a bit, oh, this is out of my comfort zone doing this because I've never really done it. I'm not used to it. First run at sort of going and filming and watching how it works and watching them, um, hearing them and sort of going through sort of how you edit it and put the graphics up and stuff. And their their content was was good, was great, and also the tips were, were pretty bloody good too. But going forward, I mean, Jacob and I know that we want to do more of this type of stuff. Um, and you know, I think there's there's great value in that. Whether it's, I mean, what the, this podcast, the Wild World of Punting, is great. You know, um, like I said before, there's another thing out there. If you enjoy wagering, that is. Some people that just, there are people out there that would watch this and go, this is the most boring shit I've ever heard, which is fair enough, right? Each to their own. No one's holding a gun to your head to watch this. And there's some people that would find the, the content that racing.com puts out much better than the content that Benny and Jason put out. That's fine too. You know, where there's a market for, there's you can have different tastes and that's absolutely fine. Watch what you like. Um, but in saying that, I do think given this like, it, to me it feels like there's a whole big, uh, there's a changing of the guard in certain sort of like with when it comes to like media and content. You know, like even looking at um, uh, the, I think it was Fox Sport or Channel 9, the NRL guys, right? Like there was a, there's a guy, uh, you might know, do you know Andy Raymond? Yeah, he, he got let go from um, Fox, Fox during, like, COVID. Right. Yeah, and he's unreal, unreal. And it was like he's now gone and he's got his own podcast. And some of his guests, yeah. he, that content is – Oh, he's got sick. all the contacts, so he gets all the biggest names in the sport, yeah. Right. Now, I reckon Touchwood and – I've never met the bloke, so if you're watching, shout out to um, shout out to you. But And I hope, I hope that it goes super for him, but it's this – it's, it feels like there's a shift away from these massive big conglomeration, like these multi fucking national businesses like Fox and News Corp or Fairfax or whoever the big media hubs are or Channel 7, Channel 9, all those. So anyone can just go out now and buy, I've got an iPad here and sit in my in my lounge in my sort of little home office and just you can have a yarn, right, and put it. And if there are people that enjoy that, they'll watch. At the end of the day, the, the people that, that – win the people that sort of benefit from that are the consumer because there's more competition competition like i mean in, in any economic situation sense competition benefits the end user because it brings down the price because they, they're they're trying to sort of undercut each other until to get the business until there's sort of like an equilibrium point where they can't go anymore other they won't make a profit so you know and in the realm of content creation, it's not really undercutting each other. It's trying to up your game. It's trying to create the best and the most engaging oh, and most beneficial content that people will want to consume. Because people have only, can only consume so much. Everyone's got X amount of free time. Yeah, exactly. And like that's what, what comes down to what you said before. Like, Of course, I know way less people than tune in weekly for my NRL tips want to hear an hour-long, you know, more in-depth betting discussion in the summer. But that's okay because there's still a few people out there yeah. that do find it interesting and like do do enjoy the conversation and do and do get interest out of it and knowledge from it. And so that's fine because we enjoy, you know, creating it. And for yourself, like you said, you haven't really delved into too much kind of putting your face in front of like content, but you've got a lot of knowledge to share and you mm. know, you are very candid and forthright with your knowledge. So like why not, you know, be more have the you've got the platform. Yeah. To be able yeah. to share it, um, but we were kind of we were delving into a bit of business there, so this is probably where we can tackle this question that a lot of people probably have in their mind, and and people might think they know how it works, but they may not. Um, which is basically like, how do you groups make money, or like if you're spending all these hours, which you talked about, um, which we can talk about a little bit more as well, like all the little bits and pieces that that are involved in running a group, and all of the expenses and costs, like obviously. You've got to run a website. You've got a, um, you know, you've got a, you've got literal hours of um, creating content. You're creating graphics. You know, 
Um, yeah. you, you're, you're giving away competitions. You're giving away merch, like all sorts of stuff that, um, you know, is costing you time and money, not to, not to mention like you're copying it. You're getting abuse, whether you're sharing tips and then you've yeah. got people abusing you or you've got people, as we said before, abusing you because, you know, you're the school principal and one kid's mum is not happy that their kid got, you know, yeah. got put down and the other kid's mum is not happy that their kid got harshly, you know, penalised for it and you, you can't win and all that. So there's a lot of um, time and stress that goes into all of this. Yes, it, it, you know, the groups make money, probably not as much as people think, um, but we're making money uh, predominantly so from guess, bookmakers yeah, and so for affiliate yeah, links. Definitely. De- yeah. definitely. So... Like, people are like, oh, you guys just work for the fucking bookies and stuff. Like, I'll explain it how it works. We're a punting group, for starters. Like, our name is Punt Hub, right? So, our, so like, I'm just trying to think of an example. Like, if you've got a, a food and beverage magazine for the pub that we get, the people that are advertising in that are going to be the people that provide food and beverage, like, um, like ovens, uh, free refrigeration, like, glassware you know what i mean because that's the audience so there's a couple of ways that bookies will 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 um and they're all different but there's a couple of ways that they can they can look to pay you some of them just flat out will say right what's it uh, they'll pay you per post um they might say like uh like if they're running a campaign like we're doing this for spring or this for this state of origin match and we want you to post in your group because you've got this platform and it's like being paid for a billboard or whatever, and it's a flat fee, and then yep. you can just decide is it worth it to you. Yeah, like I mean, it'd be nice to get more, but some of them, I mean, two hundred fifty was probably the most that we've ever been paid for a post. Um, so that gives you an idea. It's not a lot of money, and it's not like they're going to post every day, right? They'll do one. They might give you a thousand bucks a month, and you do have to do four posts in the month of leading up to spring or whatever it is. There's also CPA, which is called cash, which is stands like a commission an acronym, per acquisition. An acronym. Yeah, cash. Well, yeah, cash per acquisition. Yep. So it's like literally a fee that you will get if someone signs up to, um, you know, X Y Z bet through an affiliate link of yours. Once they deposit their their net deposit, so sorry, once they deposit fifty bucks. A minimum of fifty. So if they deposit five bucks, you get paid zero. And these are just some real examples that we've dealt with over the time. Essentially, CPA is like if people. The best way people could probably visualize it is back in the day, a lot of bookies would have like a refer a friend button, and if you clicked a link and referred a mate, and your mate signed up, you would get like a fifty dollar bonus bet. Yeah. Well, that's kind of like what we are now. Is we are the refer a mate where we put a link, and if people use it. We might get we'll get a flat rate per sign up, yep. whether it be yep. fifty. I've had as good as probably a hundred per sign up, um, yep. which you know in reality means that those bookies value each customer. Like every single customer is different. This is a flat rate that yep. just obviously works out an average. And every bookie, as it goes back to like wanting market share and obviously having a perceived value in customers. Yep. Um, they're going to give you a flat rate per sign up. So that that's one model. But even these days, um, I can tell you from my experience, when you share like profitable tips for long enough, bookies cotton on and say, actually, we're not paying you cost per acquisition for customers anymore because your customers you're sending us are not valuable. We're not actually, you know, getting that money back that we might yeah, give okay. you 50 per sign up. So that's been really challenging for me that we've seen like revenue really drop since 2017, even though we've grown our audience since then um but you talked about there's other models that involve people have got to turn over a, a limited amount which is kind of to protect the bookie so therefore that someone's not just going to jump in one time yeah maximize that offer and then and then bail um yeah and there's like there used to be there used to be hybrid like it used to all sort of be negotiable so like it used to be and then i mean i'm not going to go into exactly what our sort of terms are with different bookies because i reckon the bookies would i'd getting strife because it's meant to be, you know, you sign a contract saying it's confidential because otherwise punters.com and like those guys, everyone could just be like, what are you getting? What are you getting? I think it's like, it's kind of like sort of, you're not meant to really speak about it, but there used to be turnover based incentives. So like it didn't matter if the punters win or loss, like lost, you got paid a percentage of turnover. 
they that seems to have dried up. Um, what now? What the, the the most common thing is revenue share. Now revenue share is one way of looking. It's how much the you get a a cut of the profits that you take that bookie. You give that bookie. Now this is where it gets like people are very jaded, right? And they're like, well that and let's again be transparent. Call it what it is. It's people losing money. That's the only way that bookies make money is someone losing money, right? It's it's a like it's a like you said zero sum game. Well, it's actually a negative sum game because the bookie has to pay stacks in fees now. I'm not, but again, I'm not really. I haven't like been on top of that for a while on all the sort of the different percentages what what's paid. But effectively, if a customer deposits a hundred bucks and they have a ten dollar bet let's say their first bet wins and they win 70 bucks so they go from they've spent 10 and they win 70 so they've gone up 60 bucks so they've got 160 now then they have another couple of bets and they lose then they have another bet and they win so on like it as time goes on they they're turning over money but let's say after two weeks they lose their net loss is a hundred bucks that's all they deposited right but they might have had one thousand dollars in bets, right? So they've lost a hundred with a with a thousand. That's what people call for your audience. I don't know if they if they know. I mean, this is probably pretty basic stuff, but that's the margin. The bookies talk about a, a punter's margin. So they're losing it at ten percent, and then there's other fees and and obviously operating costs. So they've got to pay staff. They've got to pay all of these things. So that customer that's lost a hundred dollars in re- in in real terms a hundred dollar note they might have to spend that in actual ter- in in the money that the bookmaker keeps might be only 60 bucks right and then you will effectively keep a percentage of that of that 60 not of the hundred of that 60. now that's still not bad like that can be not bad money in reality like the figures it feels like our turnover is, has gone up and our revenue like the money that we make has not really gone up so whether the fees are increasing or the punters are getting smarter which is probably both and which is I, i've got no problems with punters winning that's fine that doesn't bother me at all um and all these extra fees that are coming in like also things like the email i mean we spend probably a thousand bucks a month on our email software and stuff and like and that's and we don't even use it all the time. Um, I mean, without going into the nitty gritty, and I'm not going to say to people like this is how much we make. Like most people wouldn't with their jobs or businesses that they run. Um, but I mean, we've all got other jobs. Um, you know, everyone that works at, at, at well, all my admins, and, and and I, I wish I could pay them more, but I don't really. Give them much. I give them a bit of incentives with some, you know, some bet, betting kitties. We, I put some money in an account. We own a racehorse or a share in a racehorse, and we used to own a greyhound together. That um, I paid for out of sort of like some some fees that we did, some advertising fees. So like, you know, th- at the end of the day, we don't make as much money as what people think we do. Um, if you think about it, and people like, oh, you know, ethically and morally, like we run a, a forum, a group that's based around wagering. Right, the, the people that we, we want to wager for, that we want to a- advertise for, are wagering service providers, WSPs. Right, I don't want to. We've had heaps of online casinos come to us and ask us to to promote them. I don't want to because one, none of them are. Ba- I think I don't even. I think it's illegal to advertise them in Australia, but I'm not sure about the legality. Plus, I just don't trust any of them. Like, I just don't. I don't know any of them well enough. I don't know anyone there um, well enough. I don't know any 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 like um, recourse if something goes wrong. Like if someone's like meant to be paid out five hundred thousand and the casino goes, I don't know what to like. They're not you know where they're regulated and all this stuff. So we don't do that. But you know we're open to um, you know bookmakers. We've had a couple of syndications like horse racing syndications reach out to us. Um, uh, we've had a couple of greyhound syndicators like uh, reach out to us. We've had a couple of people like that run events, like that want to do like race tours and stuff. I mean, it's been the last two years have been none because of COVID. But um, but yeah, I mean that's that's the idea. Like the idea is that we're, you know, the shows that we're going to produce that hopefully we produce are going to be predominantly sponsored by bookies. 
you know and i say to people like that's the market you're in a you're watching a punting show expect to be bombarded with bookmaker not bombarded but expect to see bookmaker ads if you're watching a betting show if you're on a site called punt hub that's talking about horse racing and and expect to see bookmaker ads that's where you bet or syndication ads do you know what i mean i'm not going to advertise dairy farmers milk even though i love it you know shout out to the farmers but like <laughs> you've got you know you've got to be real and that, and that's the way it works and that's what i mean we didn't really expect to it to get this big we kind of wanted um we kind of wanted it to be this this forum and and fun and and we also you know we wanted to make it sort of funny it was also very humorous but it can, look at the name so it's it's pretty clear that we didn't want to take things too seriously and you know all this one thing i don't like is and i like twitter's fucking cancerous like there's there seems to be more professional punters. I don't know anyone that loses on Twitter. They all just seem <laughs> to fucking win. And everyone, like, you put a, you'll say, oh, I like this thing, and they'll go, like, mug bet, like, all this plus EV shit and stuff. Like, get off your fucking high horse. Some people just enjoy a bet for a bet. Um, some people will put their money where their mouth is when they like something. You know, good luck to them. And that's just the way it is. So, I mean, hopefully that's covered sort of everything with enough sort of depth that people understand you know like if put it this way if someone signs up to a booking through my link um and deposits 250 bucks um and bets that once and loses it we will end up making very little money off that i've got some mates of mine because i've obviously worked in the industry a lot and they just said that their words were and that's very true he said there's still a lot of people to be fed, but there's not a lot of meat left on the bone. That was the way that he said it, you know? You'd hear that. As much as I said, like, 2017 was a gold rush, I think actually if you were more established in 2014, 2015, 2016, there was, like, an arms race amongst all the bookies and they were all trying to get market share and they were all, um, there was a lot of money to be made in affiliates. I think when I refer to 2017, I think that was just a perfect storm for Tripod where we got big yeah. enough just on the back end of where there was where there weren't too many restrictions on big advertising and there was an influx of signups and we I made a bit of money but I'm um talking about like 2004 5 6 7 8 9 you know what i mean like oh goodness I, yeah I knows what it was like back then like, yeah. yeah and i remember hearing like stories about the guy that would just go to like guys would just go to go to a, a pub or a tab a venue and I don't know when I've, I've got my computer here, but I don't know if you remember Tab Corp. They were just betting tote, right? So if you bet on the tab, if you had like a tab, a phone, I think it was even called phone tab, right? If you had a tab account, like a phone tab account, or if you were betting at the pub, you could only bet on tote. There was no fixed odds, right? So I remember back, and this is back then. There weren't that many corporates i remember hearing stories of guys that would employ i mean this is proper wild west they would take out i don't know they'd go out to pubs with three or four of them they'd have a couple of beers before they started they'd dress pretty sh like sharply they'd go into a into a tab venue or a pub with like um a laptop or something like a bricky old laptop um and they'd just sit and they go they'd just walk into the tab area of a pub and say, you guys having a bet? And they go, yep. They'd say, well, why bet with them when we can offer you the best of three totes? So you you can only get New South Wales tote. I'll give you sign up an account with this mob and you'll get best of three. And they'd go, what do you mean? And they'd say, sign up. I'll give you a free bet. Sign up here. Here's my computer. Put in your details. Sign up. Um, I'll make sure you've got a, a $100 free bet to, to get used to it, how to, how to, to do it. This is probably before iPhones and shit, even, I reckon. Mm. So have a bet on this, and then after that, I'll give you the number to ring your account. And they'd set them up on the spot, right? Like, I heard about that, and there'd be, like, four guys in venues doing that, and they'd just go from pub to pub to pub, all over Victoria, Adelaide, Queensland, New South, like, everywhere. Um, so that was the proper Wild West, you know what I mean? And that was when I was saying that was, like, the credit facilities. It's probably the same in the UK and it's crazy to think that that could be happening. I don't know if you know, if you've seen any of like the, the U S is now opening up. Right. Even, yeah. Even that reminds me a lot of like, 
like I was on Instagram the other day and I was just like swiping aimlessly and uh, it was, I reckon it was a Sunday. I wasn't hungover for a change and I was, what, um, like what's her name? Oh, Paige Van Zandt. She's a good sort. She was like a, a she was an ex UFC, a bare knuckle fighter now, and she's she's like she a good sort, and she takes heaps of like, like pics in her bikini, and she I think she's got an OnlyFans or something, whatever. But it was on her story, and it was like it was her, and she's like, sign up to mybookie.ag and use code Van Zant, and you'll get a thousand dollar bonus bet um, if you put in a thousand dollars that you can bet on today's UFC. And I was like, holy fuck, I haven't seen yeah. that. Like, yeah, I, I listen to American sports pods where then they promote a bookie and they say, oh, get boosted odds on this. And, like, over here you can't even talk yeah. about boosted odds and stuff. So, yeah, it is kind of like they're going through that over there and the enticements. And, again, massive battleground for market share in the U.S. So you can just imagine, like, just magnify everything that Australia has to offer just with the population alone and, yeah. Um, yeah. and the demand over there. But, yeah, to kind of – wrap a bow around affiliates as well. Obviously, there's multiple models, as we said. So there's a lot of assumption that anybody that's got links is making money off losses when that definitely is not the case all the time. And certainly, like, when you're someone like the Tripod where you're trying to promote, um, you know, profitable tips and profitable ways to bet, there's no benefit in, in the rev share model because the punters are all in profit. So I'll give another, you know, true example, bet easy. Yeah. We got affiliate links for BetEasy. And our, again, it goes back to our rationale of like any bookie that we would use, why not have a link for it? And then we'll see what happens. But BetEasy didn't give us any option of CPA. We couldn't get a flat rate per sign up, which is what we wanted to get with each bookie and what we had with most of the other bookies. So there was simply, they said rev share or nothing. So we were on revenue share, which was meant to be 25% of people's losses, right? Yeah. We were with them for years. We never made a cent. You know, the, the, yeah. the, 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 we could see the numbers and the, the, anyone who joined them with a tripod link and then it would add all the accounts together was just further and further in profit for months, years, yeah. until yeah. they joined up with Unsportsbet. But we still promoted them every week because they had some good odds and some good lines and some good yeah. promos and we were using them. So, like... People might not think that. They'd think you'd only promote what, you know, what benefits you. But, like, we were still sharing them for best bets and stuff. We never made a cent. But we still saw it. Like, they were still giving us sign-up offers. So it was still of benefit to our followers. Yeah, to your followers. And, yeah, yeah. and if you're accepting money from a bookie, the fact is no different to any sports star that you see that's on a, on a betting ad or, you know, in a betting campaign. All money that bookies make is from losses of their customers. Hunters. That's yeah, all that bookies yeah. don't make money any other way. So any money that bookies give to anybody for advertising, what they give to Facebook or what they give to Fox Sports or what they give to Ricky Ponting or whatever is obviously, you know, a share of punting losses. So the morality side to it, I do understand that. And I think it's important that people do understand that. That like yeah. there's people out there that might be promoting a bookie that may be benefiting in some way from people who use it if they lose. But so that is you've got to have confidence and trust in the source that if you know if you're gonna follow their tips or you're gonna follow their content or you're gonna use their link, like do you have that trust that they're doing the right thing by you? And it goes back to what you said before, what we've discussed as well is like short term versus long term gain. If someone's got longevity, like Punt Hub's been around for years, so has Tripod, we're not doing things to benefit ourselves in the short term. We're not selling people um promising people the world to sign up to everything tomorrow and then because we're going to give you all these tips that are guaranteed to win and then it doesn't happen. Unfortunately, there are a lot of services out there that will tell you anything you want to hear to get you in the door, whether it be to, to subscribe or to use yeah. their link. But where if you're not going to – this is where it comes back to, like, people say you work for the bookies. Well, I get that a lot or um, you probably do after a loss. People are yeah. saying, oh, it's because, you know, as if to say that I can predict the future and I knew it would lose and I would give it out on purpose or something like that and ignore every other winner, you know, what, 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 how does that work then? If you give out more winners than losses, there's no money in it for you under the rev, rev share model. So I mm. think it's a bit misguided when people say that, but, you know, people, people will, will paint everyone with the same brush and say, like, you work for the bookies if a tip loses. Well, it's, it comes down to what you're... Um, what your audience is like exactly Man, what you said. like audience is punters and they need bookmakers so i actually think 
It's doing a service to our followers to promote to them the most reliable bookies. And like, and I said this to people, look, man, if you think we're trying to tip losers, get go get some money, put it into Betfair and lay every bet. Now, <laughs> you would have made a fortune if you'd done that following me, following us <laughs> the last couple of weeks. But but before that, you you know we we tipped a couple of things at sixteen bucks, twelve bucks, you know twenty twenty one dollars. We had like we were having profitable late or borderline, you know weeks where we either just win or just lose. Um, but you know, and we had a lot of like things running sort of seconds and thirds that each way punters could have still and that were paying well over two bucks a place. So each way punters could have like made money on that. You know, one thing I always say to that, if you think where people are trying out there trying to tip losers it's because they want to make money off your losses, you can do the opposite of that. You can go on a bet fair and, and back these things to lose, which is lay bet. Anyway, or in sport, you can just bet the other team. It's even easier yeah. than that. So, yeah, 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 there's always people that act like, oh, they know for sure, like, oh, you're deliberately losing and think, like, I wouldn't say a word if I knew that was the case. I'd have a free gold mine that if I really – really thought it was true that somebody was deliberately feeding losses to their followers because somehow they knew what the result was going to be. All you got to do is go and bet the opposite side, then you're guaranteed to win, aren't you? Yeah, exactly. But somehow I've never seen anybody um, manage to do that that's successfully so for too long. Yeah. But that's just something that we cop. But, you know, that's actually why it's better to kind of to share the truth behind it because some people had no idea about this kind of stuff. Others did but might have had the wrong idea too. So... You know, and we're obviously open to answer more questions or whatever in the comments. With the bookies that we do promote, um, we've helped heaps of people with with uh, countless amounts of things, and and the like the haters and the naysayers and the and the the you know people with gripes will say, well, the customer can just go and 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 talk to the bookie themselves. Like, I'll ask the audience, how many times have you? spoken to someone whether it's live chat i don't really use live chat i prefer a phone call that just don't know it's like that won't know the answer to like a simple question like hi um this looks like it's been incorrectly resulted can you please check and they'll just it'll be something generic they're like hi um our traders reserve the right um to result things based on blah 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 and you're like no 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 we're kind of a bit of a middleman in that sense where some people out there, and there's not that many, and I said before, so it sounds contradictory that I'm like, have you asked the bookmaker? Um, there are some things that that they will that they may they may have checked with the bookmaker, and the bookmakers come back and said, uh, or they've got someone on on um, live chat that doesn't know, and it's like, no, that's done correctly, and they'll come to us and they go, hey, look, I'm scratching my head here. We, I reckon this is wrong. Like they've come back. And I'll look at it and I'll go to their rules and I'll go, no, you're right. That's that's incorrectly resulted. That should be a push or that should be a void. That should be whatever based on. So we will then contact the bookie through the back end and say, hey, guys, look, um, I've just spoken to, you know, Mr. Smith. Um, he said this and this happened. He spoke to someone. Can you just have a look at it and check? And I'll get and our sort of the people that we talk to, are a bit more versed in punting. You know, we talk, we talk with guys um, higher up the, the CS, the customer services team. So they'll look at it and go, shit, mate, you're right, thank you. We'll get in touch with that customer. I'll go back to the guy and say, hey, Mr. Smith, they did fuck up. They're going to ring you and apologise and let me know how it goes. So that's – and that's not like – it's not like we're the flying doctor and saving lives, but it's helping people that may have – um not being able to find help or it's answering some people a lot of people are really scared to ask questions because they're like oh is this a really dumb question um but but this happened so and yeah. and you could be could be, have a volume of people reporting similar incidents to you and then you could kind of yeah aggregate that and then report to the bookie and it could be something like oh look in your terms and conditions you've got something that is is misleading people or people aren't happy with and so each individual is being told, oh, no, your bet's resulted correct because of our terms and conditions. But you could bring up a broader issue to the bookie and say, well, there's a, something that's saying. causing confusion. Yeah, and yeah. everyone's saying and it's putting people yeah. off and you we can actually that. enact change. Yeah, and we do, do that a lot. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, man. And like even this conversation, we've, we've been we've been yarning for a while, but there's so much. Like there's so much to know about punting, like, and it's quite intimidating for new people coming and like, and you know, I guess we want to be we want to be funny, we want to be laid back, but we also want to provide some sort of value add. Like we want people to go, yeah, that pun hub's all right, or pun hub's like we don't. I don't need people going like pun hub's the fucking best. Like, rah, rah, rah. like, yeah, pun hub's good. Like I learn a couple of, even if they learn two or three pieces of information. And then they end up leaving and getting off the punt. At least we've served a purpose, right? We just want to stick to punting. We want to do it pretty well. We don't want to be take it too seriously. We don't expect people to, to devote hours and hours of their day in the group. They can if they want to, um, or they can just come and go as they please, you know. Um, I think the fact that we've been pretty sort of laid back and reasonable and flexible like that is part of the reason we've sort of grown and um you know we always try to say in a lot of our side things like yes we make a kickback off this if you don't like it go and sign up without using us that's fine we're not going to lose sleep over it like i'll put up a link for neds or ladbrokes or unibet or Boombet or one of the other ones who, who else is there bet right or another guy and like if people are like oh you guys just make like money out of this yeah we do if you don't like it just go to their website without using my link Right, you know, if they want to use our website and, and help support the group, that's great. You know, either way, you know, it is. What yeah, it is. I mean, the conversation like we've had now maybe gives people an idea of like why it might be worthwhile using a link, like because it supports a group and all the things that go on behind the scenes that maybe yeah. people don't see. But it's everyone's individual choice. Like I say, the same. Just do what ever decision you feel is the best choice for you you know we're yeah, exactly. not you know expecting anything out of anybody and come and go as you please and if it's worthwhile it's worthwhile um that's heaps man i've got like uh, heaps to work with so i appreciate it thanks again to mark that was his first ever interview of that kind and i found him great to talk to i did try and tidy it up with the editing again apologies if you felt it jumped a little bit it was just for me to condense as much of a chat that was over three hours into a little bit more manageable kind of couple of um our episodes of the wide world of punting but the great thing about chatting to Mark was the fact that we went off on tangents sometimes gave us heaps of interesting ground to cover. If you enjoyed it, please let us know. And if you've raised any other questions or you want any more kind of information, anything that comes to mind, just jump in the comments of YouTube or on the Facebook posts and feel free to ask us. Next up, we've got Tristan. So Tristan's back. He's going to talk about challenges that his business has faced in the last 10 to 15 years, including like stiff competition from some much larger operations that have, have come along and some have come and gone and some have merged and we get into all that. Um, the topic of how punters often used to be able to get much bigger bets down on much more bookies than they can now and why that's the case, how all the legislation has affected and restricted his business's ability to grow and to market to new customers and how they how they deal with that. We cover other major changes in the industry, such as, you know, extinct or nearly extinct practices, such as punters betting with credit. But our chat begins discussing the rapid evolution in the last decade of technology and punter behavior and how that's affected running a bookmaker. Yeah, oh, it's been a massively evolving space. Like when I first got my start, I was on course. My dad was one of the biggest bookmakers in Australia for a long time and he was on the on course at Gold Coast and in Sydney and, and I worked for him and I was at uni at the time and we went from just where you could only take bets when you're on the track. So you'd go there and it seems uh, it seems like such a big shift. We used to go to the track on Saturday morning with our prices of, uh, of, of what the – of what the footy games were for for five thirty, so that people would come up after the races and have a bet, and we didn't have the information on if Joey Johns was going to pull out for the night, so we'd still be betting the same prices that what we had at the start of the day. It seems very naive in retrospect, but obviously you only had a very small pool of punters. You were reliant on people that were at the track or ringing up on on our official phones, where we could only take the bets on course. So then I was at uni and I saw everyone betting away on their smartphones or on their laptop in class and. I sort of said, well, this is probably something we need to investigate. And we went online and it just changed things massively. A, it opens the door to a lot of extra customers, a lot of different customers where you're, you're not just looking at that pool of people that you build up over a long period of time. Obviously, they they still come to you online, but it gives them the ability to access it. And most importantly, from our point of view, just having the ability to ring and place a bet outside of when you're actually on that race course, which is so key because we can never take a bet on a Friday night footy game 
um, when we were only fielding on Saturday. So that was huge. And then just for punters to be able to, if they're at the pub, um, to, to either get on their smartphone, to ring up from there, uh, do it at any time. It was it was something from our our perspective that really changed the the amount of turnover we took, um, and and also from a customer's point of view, it, it gives them access to a lot more information. They they they're not also backed into a corner that they could only have a bet over a specific window as well, where they didn't have all the all the certainty over player moves. For example, we could only take a bet on a Sunday game when we we're at the track on Saturday. So punters obviously didn't have all the information at hand. You weren't you weren't to know who was going to play the next day too. So it was such a massive change when all of these these things evolved. Do you recall ever someone coming and having a big bet on like a sports result and you kind of thinking, oh, have we like, have we got our odds or our line correct for this one? Oh, I, I just remember saying to dad after the first season, how come we keep losing on these games? It was, uh, <laughs> it was, it seems so obvious in, in hindsight, but punters were obviously clued into it. We didn't have the information and we were, we were putting up really stale markets and we weren't on top of it. We were focused on the racing. And we had the, you know, some really big professional punters that we'd, we'd release our markets. And this is how the industry shift. We, we used to work on Wednesday at the track and Saturday at the track. So we were only able to take bets in those two periods. And everyone knows now the markets move so heavily and, and the, the limits and the liquidity is not there on a Wednesday when the markets go up. I know they go up on a Monday and Tuesday now, but Wednesday is when the totals go up for us. And um, we had to bet much bigger than what we were comfortable betting on a Wednesday because we knew we didn't get an opportunity to take any more bets until Saturday rolled around. So if we wanted some action on the Friday night, uh, we needed to take a pretty decent crack on Wednesday, which in hindsight wasn't the most profitable way to do it, but it was the only way we could le- we could legally do it. So it was um, it, it was a very, very steep awakening and, and we uh, we realised pretty quickly into our new ventures online what, uh, what we'd been doing that was probably not the most efficient way to price things in the early days. And the other thing that I always think about back in the early days and even when I first would, would have been having sports bets, like the monopoly that the TAB used to have over sports betting, really it was the only feasible way anyone really wanted to have a punt, you know, on, a, on an upcoming sports event or the, the by far the vast majority of people would walk into their, their local tab. But as you say, that, that evolution of technology and once we all got like the internet, you know, in the palm of our hand, then that opened up, well, I don't have to just bet with TAB anymore. I can bet with any online, you know, uh, betting provider. So that would have that would have opened um, up an opportunity for you guys to get a lot more customers and turnover that way. But I guess also would have um, added a lot more competition into the marketplace. Oh, for sure. Like a couple of things on that point. The TAB's market were were pretty accurate because back then they were taking size or bets off everyone because, as you say, that was the a one-stop shop. So a lot of people could walk in there. They could have their five and ten thousand dollar bets on a Wednesday, and and that there'd be a good chance of those bets being accepted. Um, so the market was reasonably accurate. But from a punting point of view, you only had that one outlet. So if you, you know, if, if you didn't like the three and a half, you could wait for maybe it to drift, or you you were sort of a bit hamstrung as to what line you can take. Now with the competition and the amount of different options out there, there there's a lot of games where you can, you know, if the line's three and a half at one place, it might be too flat at somewhere else. It could be four flat somewhere else. Um, you know, there, there's so many different opportunities for punters now to get increased value just purely on the back of competition and and differing of opinions. So the marketplace has really evolved in that sense for a punter's point of view. Um, I know there's been some changes. There's been positive and negative changes from a punter's point of view, but I think that's the overwhelming positive now that there's so many different options. The market percentage is so much more attractive from a punter's point of view, just purely because of the amount of different options you have there. Yeah, I still remember clearly, like TAB, that was my first introduction to sports betting and I'd always look at their prices and any 50-50 line was $1.85. There's no one to compete against, you know? Like now you'd think that's a bit stingy if a bookie's only offering $1.85 both sides of a 50-50, but if they had no one to compete against, we just took that as the norm. So speaking of, I guess, competition, um, do you remember this sort of timeline when some big bookies came to compete in Australia? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it was an evolving space. So Sportsbet um, have been known as Sportsbet for a long period of time. They're a massive company now, but they probably have changed in the last five or six years since Paddy Power's taking over to be a real bulk provider. And they've, they've, you know, they, they lead in most concepts with a lot of their marketing and all of that. But they used to be, they used to take some massive bets. They used to, like Matt Tripp is a, is a really prominent figure in in the gambling world, and and he uh, he, he was uh, you know he, he was a big punter and a, and a big bookmaker, and he had really strong limits. And he he was they were one of the you know the first bookmakers to really take on and offer a heap of sports and take really sizable bets. 
Centibet were probably the, the first bookmaker to really go in that space. They were a, a massive company as well, where uh, they eventually merged with Sporting Bet, who in turn went to William Hill, and then in turn went to Bet Easy, and now Bet Easy and Sports Bet emerged. So there's been many, many evolutions. There was Alan Iskander, who was with BetStar. Uh, they were another sort of uh, bookmaker that were sizable, and then they got a, a, overtaken, I think, by bookmaker.com, and then Ladbrokes uh, swallowed them up. So there, there's been a lot of evolutions. Um, when we first started, it was uh, it was more your, your uh, you know, probably a lot of bookmakers similar to us, where even though they were corporates, they were family-type operations, two- or three-man operations, um, where it was more bookmakers gravitating from the racetrack to having a, a presence online like what we have and we do. And then when the influx of the overseas bookmakers came, when Paddy Power came and took over sports, but it was big news. It was uh, it, it started the trend in a lot of ways where we lost a lot of those, uh, you know, those, those more individual-based corporates and and the, the, the overseas raiders have come in and they've, they've done a good job in some respects. As I said, there, there's so many more options now for punters. Uh, there's you know, a lot more promotions and these sort of things that probably weren't there back in the day as well, but it certainly has shifted. And I'd say it would have been that seven or eight year period ago where Paddy Power came in and then, you know, it's a few others started to follow suit. Does that make life more difficult for you guys because they're more powerful? They've got like bigger marketing power, bigger marketing draw. And as you mentioned, like bigger promotions potentially and ones that they can advertise to people. So how did you find that when these, you know, the big boys come in and they're obviously all fighting for market share. So they're trying to be as attractive as they can be. And they are trying to poach customers too. Did you like guys kind of feel that pressure? Yeah, it's a tricky one. Like it, 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 it comes in and there's a lot of pressure associated with that because you've got some really, really big companies that are coming in that, you know, just buy and sell us every day of the week in terms of what their budgets are, what their their staff forces are, what their number of markets, what their resources are. You, you can't compete with them head to head. But what we can do is we can find our niche. And what we have done is found our little niche where we can sort of sit into a little uh, a little space where we, we can sort of make it our own. And and um, like we we probably bookmark a little bit differently to the others now, but back in the day we were bookmaking like everyone else. So um, the the other companies have come in and they have changed the landscape, and and it does make it more difficult. But it's also one of those ones where it creates, as I said, creates an opportunity. So um, it's it's just trying to not worry too much about what the others are doing, trying to focus on our own backyard and try to do the best job we can do. Because at the end of the day, we haven't really changed too much over those years, and we're we're now we're just trying to get a little bit of market share back ourselves, but you have to do it in a smart way because if you go toe to toe with them, there's only going to be one winner. Yeah, competition is definitely good for punters because everyone's trying to up their game, but also that like means you're not going to have complacency. Another point you kind of made there about how you know sports bet used to take some really massive wages. It does seem to me, but this is kind of more anecdotal that people used to get their bigger bets on a bit easier, and and almost so then that would make me feel like nowadays. A lot of bookmakers are a lot more conservative or have a lower risk profile. And like, do you know, do you know why that might be the case, if that's true? Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it is. And this is in no way disrespect to sports, but some they used to take bigger bets. Like they, they, they are still a, the premium or the premier bookmaker in, in the country, in my opinion. And, and they, they are very, very fair at what they do at the moment. But probably six or seven or eight years ago, you, 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 it would be absolutely uh, a regular occurrence where people could have five, ten, fifteen thousand at multiple different bookmakers, and they 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 could get a hundred thousand on a game very, very easily across five or six different agencies if they wanted to. It's almost impossible now for for sharp punters to be able to do that, and uh, there, there's a com a couple of different reasons for that. Is that the product fees that come in? So. At, you know, back in the day, there used to be minimal turnover expense. So if, if you had someone that was breaking square, they were breaking square. If someone breaks square these days, they're costing the bookmaker a lot of money. So you, the, a number of the bigger operators are probably not wanting to facilitate that business because of the fact that at the end of the day, they have to communicate to their shareholders. It, it's not a case of now me sitting there like, like an old book, bookmaker on a stand where you're willing to take this person on mono on mono and see who's the better the, the better punter or the bookmaker at the end of the day, when you're a really big company like some of these others are, you 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 have to you have to think of your shareholders' interest at, at the at the end, at be all and end all because at the end of the day, as much as it's all great to to be a bookmaker, a, a really big bookmaker, be betting big limits. If you don't get the results, then you've got to convey this information back to a number of other people that don't understand it as well. So it, it's a case of I, I think now a lot of the bigger operators they completely run by, you know, 
uh, margins and they have to be making X amount on turnover. And if they aren't, even if they have increased turnover and they're making 5% instead of 8%, um, the requirements that they have to do, I don't know the inner workings of it, but to me, that's probably the biggest change in that there's, there's a lot of uh, other people that have come in that help make those decisions now. The product fees also are huge, like they're a massive change in dynamic because uh, as I said, you can't you can't afford to take on a, a break-even customer to high levels anymore. It, it, it puts you out backwards and, uh, and and it's very difficult to do. We obviously try and we have very, very fair limits to everyone, but it means our margins are way for thin. And um, you know, a, a lot of the bigger agencies that have to report back to their shareholders aren't prepared to do that. That that is really fascinating. I've heard people say like, "Oh, I got banned from this bookie, and I wasn't even, I didn't even make a killing." And you say you think, "Well, that can't be right. Like, why would they knock you away unless you like, you know, hit them for a good whack?" But kind of what you're saying there that if they're if they're turning over money each week, and one week they're up a little, next week they're down, but overall they're they're plugging away. They don't think they're doing anything wrong. Well, they're not doing anything wrong, but because of all the fees associated with their turnover, they are pure liability at that point for the bookie. So that's interesting that it's like if you know if tax and fee structures come in that are causing the bookies to want nothing but um, clients that are very profitable for them, then that's definitely not a not a great thing for people that are um, you know trying to bet with any any type of edge, and it does make things a lot a lot tougher. And I just think um, if there's a bit more knowledge and transparency out there, then I think more bookies may follow suit like what, along the lines of what you guys do, where if the reputation gets out there that certain bookies aren't, you know, are willing to to take that on despite the challenges, um, you're still willing to take a fair bet and not ban people purely for winning. And then that's going to hopefully you'll get the reward because you'll get more customers Then other bookies follow suit. And, you know, then and then everybody's better off, at least in my view. Maybe that's optimistic. But um, talking about how the you know, things have changed. Um, how about how's how's your marketing changed as well? Like we spoke about. A few years ago when the bookies were a few of the big corporate um, bookies were really trying to make a push to to get a bigger market share it was almost open slather in terms of like promotions and what they could what they could offer people to make it attractive to join up now it's way way stricter in terms of like no form of enticement and there's been a transition for this from what i remember it started like certain states like south australia I remember being stricter than other states but at this point in time it's virtually across the board and it's very hard to really just market to one state but can you remember kind of like the evolution of of marketing your brand your business um over the last few years what you've been able to do and what yeah what you can't now yeah oh, it's been a massive change and to be fair we never really marketed in the in the peak of when uh you could really open slather you could say whatever you wanted um we we, we tried it once in the year fear won the melbourne cup and we got a stack of customers and you, you could openly advertise opening deposit matches. You could you could offer whatever you wanted and and um and that was all about getting extra customers and now that's completely changed, which I think is is is, is a good thing. I, I I think there's some benefits there where some you know uh you, you don't want to in, induce someone to open an account and um and and think that it's it's a it's a guaranteed win like that. That that's the that's the purpose behind these sort of things. There used to be a lot of turnover requirements on on bonus bets and these sort of things. So there's been a big change and a big shift in that mentality where if you are to give a bonus bet out now, there's no turnover requirements that punters can have. So there, there, there's been a big change in a whole variety of it. There's still a lot of gray area. It's still very, very difficult to know exactly what you can and can't say. And we've never ever gone out there with the intent to ever try to breach or break any laws. But um, it's, <laughs> there's so many different rules. Like you touched on that it was more strict in one state than others. and there's still a big differences across the board and 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 obviously being a smallish sort of company compared to some of the bigger boys we haven't got the big legal teams or the big regular you know the to be able to so we we very much err on the the really cautious side of these sort of things so um there's been a big shift as you say it's it's changing more even when you could and couldn't advertise you know like that the, I, I think there's a there's been a change in when ads go up on live tv all these sort of things, and 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 I think in in some sense there's been a really positive shift in that sense. There, there's been a lot of focus on responsible gambling, which is so important. It's so important that people do uh, bet responsibly. They can bet within their means. There's been a lot of changes in that space where now that you know when someone opens an account, they physically have to opt in with uh, you know a limit, or they have to physically you know actively opt out. So they have to make a decision as opposed to customers having the 
ability themselves to put it on. So there's that original trigger question. There's all these other things along the way where emails get sent out where every six months when people log in, they have to reset their limit, all these sort of things, which I think are really positive changes. So it's been an ever evolving landscape and I don't think we're at the the, the right stage. I, I don't think we're at the finishing position yet. I think there's some things that maybe have gone a little bit too far, some things that haven't gone far enough, but we're sort of moving and we're, we're learning, we're growing. And I think that's the, the most important thing. So in the last year, would it be fair to say, because um, you mentioned that you guys are, you know, actively trying to grow now and kind of like showcase what you're about and what you can do to, to a larger customer base. So this has been the biggest year you've ever had of like marketing, but restrictions have never been greater than they are now. So how big of a challenge have you found that? Yeah, well, we are fortunate in some respects that we do have that point of difference and that we are, we do have very aggressive prices. We do take bigger bets, but that only resonates with a certain part of the audience as well. So it does make it difficult. You, you, you don't have the ability to basically put an ad out there for someone to give you a try and to to see that we have a better product than where they may have been betting previously. So it certainly is a challenge. You have to go to a lot of different uh, facets. You have to go TV, you have to go radio, you have to go Facebook, as you say, or social media, Google AdWords. There's so many different ways to do it. You, you need to get people involved that know exactly what they're doing. But it is a really tricky scenario because back in the day, you used to be able to you know, offer someone an open, a bonus bet to, 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 try, to try your product out and you can't anymore. And so you're relying on someone moving from a bookmaker and and for us like our, our entire goal with it, if anything is is not to try to bring someone on that doesn't enjoy a punt just on the back of giving them a bonus bet that, that that's certainly not in our dna what we're trying to do is people that enjoy a punt we want them to, to try our product as opposed to wherever they're betting now and we're confident when they come over to our product they'll see what they like they'll realize the odds are, are in a lot of cases better they'll realize the offering's great but it's very difficult to to bring or drag someone away from where they're currently enjoying themselves to, to try a different option. So that's the difficulty we're finding, obviously being a little bit late to the party in the sense that a lot of others, you know, and once you have a customer, you can you can say a lot of things that there, there aren't as many restrictions at that point. So it is a difficult balancing act where, where we're up against, but we're doing our best. And, and, and I think we've got that benefit of being able to really sell an Australian owned product, uh, or, you know, some of the benefits, that, that's, that's the thing you need to find a point of difference you need to legally find a point of difference that you can advertise and, and that, that's that's a tricky element to it. Yeah, and it would be tricky for you because it's like people don't like change. Like, um, for example, I got, you know, the first smartphone I ever got was an iPhone and I think they've just got me now. I know lots of people might tell me Android is better or I know that some people on one camp or another, but to me it's like almost even if someone could categorically prove to me an Android phone was better, I don't know if I'd change because I'm just too used to it. And I just don't, I don't even like when my phone tells me there's a new software update because it just means something's going to be slightly different. So, but maybe that's just me becoming an old guy, not wanting things to change. But I think that's human nature as well, kind of status quo. So for a lot of people, their bookie that they use, that if they're comfortable with it, then they just don't really necessarily want to look for anything different just because what they're familiar with. So that is hard to kind of, as you say, break that mold. Um, I've had this big conversation with with Mark Porter on the, on the last couple of pods as well, um, you know, and he's worked in the industry too. And we talked about a, a number of different, you know, um, activities and um, and procedure that, that's gone on that would not be, you know, allowed now. Just in other examples, some people may be familiar, other people might be kind of mind blown. But one thing he brought up now, which kind of sounds insane, and I was kind of familiar of this a few years ago, never dabbled myself but like um the concept of credit betting do you remember like when that was legal in the industry and um and and have any kind of memories it sounds very problematic um people being allowed to bet with credit yeah and and it was and and um for us uh and, and to be transparent out there there is still credit available if you go on course um you can bet with on course bookmakers if their turnover is under a certain figure so it, it was a staple for years and years and years credit betting on course where you know it was people coming up to a, a stand and, and handing over big uh, numbers of dollars like it just wasn't something that was it, it was never really thought of as being i guess problematic it was just more efficient and and it was a case if you'd only provide or you'd only give credit if uh if, if someone had the credentials to be able to warrant it so we um my, my dad in particular who as who as i said was on course for many many years he was a bank manager he was very um 
you know, restrictive in what credit he gave out. He would make sure that someone ticked all the boxes and he treated as if they were coming in for a bank loan in order to give them a, a, a credit facility. So we were very um, prudent in, in who we gave our credit facilities to. Some of the other agencies probably weren't. They were trying to uh, attract more business. They were giving customers, you know, a couple of hundred dollars credit to, to keep them betting with, with that company. And that was probably the, 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 the tipping point that caused credit to be completely abolished because in isolation, if someone had a $200 credit facility, it probably wasn't the end of the world, but then they could go and say, I've got a $200 credit facility at Bookmaker X. Can I have 200 credit facility at your agency? And they might go to 10 or 15 different bookmakers and all of a sudden they've got 2,000 or 3,000 credit that they couldn't um, afford. And that was the real problematic issue. And that was something that we were, um, we, we were, originally we were a bit concerned when the credit legislation came in because we had some high profile customers that had quite sizable credit limits that, you know, were able, and it was, it wasn't irresponsible. It was credit facilities that they could afford. And we were wondering how that would change our business being a quite a small bookmaker at that point when, when the change came in. But since the change has occurred, it's actually been a, one of the biggest positives in this industry, I feel. I feel now people are used to it. They're, they're, they're not, um, they're, they're obviously having to have the money up front. They, they know what they can put in. There's a lot of deposit limits that have come in play, which were never as, as prevalent as what they are now, you know, and, and it's, it, all these things are really positive for the industry because you want someone to be betting sustainably with you for a long period of time. That's important. You want them to enjoy having a bet and you want them to do it responsibly. It's all very, very important. So it's been a significant shift and, um, and, and, and I think it's it's something that there's still plenty of things that need to be done to continue that. I, I know they're talking about removing credit cards from uh, being able to deposit. So it has to be a debit card or a poly, which again, I think is a, is, is a positive step. So um, there's there's so many changes. There's so, so many changes still to come. I think one of the big things, which is part of the, the national consumer framework, which is coming into play, is that if you've got a, a deposit limit with us um, in a number of months, it's going to go into a um, in, into a central sort of forum where you're required to have that same deposit limited at, at all of your accounts, which is going to be interesting how they how they police that and, and, and how efficient it works. But I certainly think it, that's also a good uh, a good uh, situation as well, because we might have someone that might have a $200 weekly limit and they'll email or call in if they're at that limit and they'll say, oh, is, can I please elevate this to 500 or 1,000 if they've lost their 200? And obviously that can't be done. Uh, you can elevate a limit, but there is a seven-day cooling off period. So... I think that's a really positive thing, but the reality is someone then might go and open an account at another bookmaker and then they won't set any limits and all of a sudden they might knock off 500 or 1,000, which they, they can't afford to be doing. So I, I think that is going to be the biggest change and it's going to be a, a really positive thing for responsible gambling. Obviously, we've got to find out a way to be able to protect them from you know utilising cash at some of the terminals because that doesn't change. Or So it, there still is an onus on on punters, but there is a, uh, there, there is a lot of changing spaces in this in this game and i think a lot of them are positive finally time for the why world bet of the week the random af multi from episode one it's looking solid we've got the man city leg up last week's tip unfortunately fell short we had dallas to be the highest scoring team in the nfl thanksgiving games they were in a wild high scoring game 33 all overtime but we lost the heartbreaker so despite being a dollar 30 favorite before the game biggest favorites of the day and me liking their chance of being high scoring. Well, they weren't the highest scoring team even in their own match. That's a loss. Unfortunately, the next tip is going to be another like long form future tip. I like to share these out. You guys know I've shared a bunch of these on several different events or competitions across a range of, uh, of different sports. Um, and it gives you something to ride the whole way through the competition if you like the sound of it. So the Big Bash kicks off this weekend. Um, and I'm going to try my hand at coming up with a custom multi that you can ride along if you like. I'm not going to pretend to be a cricket expert. I welcome anyone's thoughts who is one. Um, I've just done a deep dive into all futures markets for the Big Bash. I'm definitely confident from my perspective that um, I've cooked up something that's pretty good value. So we've got the Re Melbourne Renegades to miss the top five. There are eight teams. The top five make the finals. The Renegades finished bottom last year. They are once again bottom all across the board in the betting odds. Sorry if you're a Renegades fan. It's hard to kind of see them fitting into the top five. They're in the market. They're about 50-50 to make or miss. I got them to miss. Next part, Sydney Thunder to make the top five. So again, if you've got to kind of consider each aspect, if the Melbourne Renegades have missed, that leaves seven teams vying for five spots. 
I've got Thunder well and truly in the mix. In the marketplace, they're about $1.60 to make it, so I've got them getting in. And then the final leg, it's a slightly longer shot leg to get our odds up nice and high, and that's the Hobart Hurricanes to make the final. So if you look at just that bet on its own, that's paying about $3.50, and they're about $1.50 to be in the finals, as in top five. Obviously, they've got to make that to have a chance to make the final. Um, the higher up they finish, the more advantageous it gets with, with seeding. So we've kind of got to hope that the Renegades miss out, Thunder and Hobart um, both get in, and then we get $12 on this on this multi to get up um, for the boys from Tassie to make the final. Don't have to win it, just be in the final two. I didn't deliberately set out to pick for or against any specific teams. I just more looked at the market, see what I can negotiate with Toppy. But I guess it is kind of cool the way it's worked out. We're, I'm presuming a very small portion of our audience is from that far south. So maybe the Hurricanes can be your second team this season. But, um, you know, across the fact that we've got three different teams, make or miss, and then how everyone's going to be vying for ladder positions, it kind of means every single night, every game, something is going to impact our bet. So it gives you something you can ride. The max stake is $50. If you like it, it's on top sport. It's going to be under cricket markets. If you don't have Top Sport, as always, you can plug in the code TRIPOD if you want to join them. Um, and you should understand, of course, they sponsor the show and make the show possible. That's the episode. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for the support. Any small support all makes a difference, whether that's pressing like, commenting, or subscribing on whichever channel you follow this on. Good luck if you're jumping on the Wild World Better of the Week or any punts you have this week. Please gamble responsibly and Lego.